This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Stay tuned to the end for a very special offer for Arvind Ash viewers. More than 2,000 years ago, the Greek philosopher Democritus first coined the term atom, meaning uncuttable, something you can't split into smaller pieces. If you take a piece of metal and cut it in half, then cut it in half again, and do this over and over again, he figured there must be a smallest piece of metal that cannot be cut any further. And so it must be the fundamental particle of the material, the atom. This search for a deeper understanding of the fundamental nature of matter has brought mankind to the physics of today. And we now have an understanding that the ancient Greeks could not have even dreamed about. So what do we know now that Democritus didn't know? After 2000 years, we have today the standard model of particle physics, which is like the periodic table of fundamental particles. These are the particles that almost everything in the universe reduces to. But the question is, what really are fundamental particles? Can we say what they're made of? The answer, which may surprise you, is coming up right now. If you ask 10 physicists what a particle is, it would not be surprising to get 10 different answers. In my previous video, I talked about how light comes in discrete packets of energy called photons. We learned that these photons act as both a particle and a wave. This is the wave-particle duality of nature. Quantum mechanics revealed by the Schrodinger equation that all quantum objects should not be considered particles, but more like waves smeared out in space. They are described by a mathematical term called a wave function. This function describes the state of the object. It doesn't tell us where a particle is, but only the probability of where it might be if we measured it. The wave function tells us that what we call a particle is spread out over space until the moment we measure it. And as soon as we do, the wave function representing the particle suddenly collapses so that it's not spread out any longer, but is localized around a distinct point. The double slit experiment is the classical example of this collapse. If we send one photon at a time through the double slit thousands of times, we see a wave pattern. But if we stick a detector at the slit to measure which slit the photon is going through, we get rid of the wave pattern. The wave function has collapsed. Why does the wave function, which is a mathematical expression describing the probabilities of a particle, suddenly collapse upon measurement? Why or how this happens is not well understood and is known as the measurement problem of physics. So we have something that could best be described as a spread out wave prior to measurement. But after measurement, we get a delta function, which has a spike like a localized wave. This is something representing more like a particle. So is a particle just a collapsed wave function? Perhaps. But this leaves us with more questions than answers because we don't really even know what a wave function collapse means. As you might have surmised, it's not that simple to answer the question of what a particle is. And if you ask a physicist, he might just go straight into the math, describing a particle. And the answer he may give you could be purely in mathematical terms. But the world we are in is physical. Math is just a tool used to describe the physical reality. If pushed for something more concrete, some physicists will just tell you that particles are simply those objects that we detect. But these answers are deeply unsatisfying. So let's not do that. And instead, let's look at what the current best description is based on what we know. What we have learned about particles from quantum mechanics is that we can consider photons in terms of a wave packet. This wave packet can be looked at as a kind of particle. And something similar can be done for describing other particles as well. But their wave aspect smears out their properties, like position and momentum. The Schrodinger equation works quite well in describing the wave nature of quantum objects, but it has some limits. It does not account for special relativity. This happens specifically when the velocity is close to the speed of light. In order to account for relativistic effects, space and time have to be treated equally. But if you look at the Schrodinger equation, you'll see that time and space are not treated equally. In the 1930s, scientists realized that one could get an even better formulation of quantum mechanics than what physicists like Schrodinger achieved by considering quantum objects in terms of quantized fields. 
When this is done, the equations of quantum mechanics could be modified to account for special relativity by treating space and time equally. This led to quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, what we call particles are quantized waves in a field that spreads throughout space-time. The idea of quantized fields was a necessary step in order to describe objects like photons and other fast-moving objects that demand to be treated according to the rules of special relativity, which starts to have a significant effect at or close to the speed of light. Quantum field theory is nothing but a theoretical framework that unites ideas from classical fields, special relativity, and quantum mechanics. The idea is like this. You start with a field, or analogously, picture yourself a calm C. This is an empty field without any particles. This is our starting point. It may sound a little bit weird, but stay with me here. Imagine that this field, or C, stretches throughout all of space-time. Note that this would be in three dimensions, but for visualization purposes, we are representing this in two dimensions, like the surface of the ocean. Now imagine that there is a wave in the sea. This is a particle in our field. Then there can be another wave, which represents another particle. In the field, each particle is an excitation of the field, just like a wave in the sea. Because we are considering our particles as waves, if we collide them, the particles collide like waves, just as in the double slit experiment. There is, however, at least one difference between the quantum field and our ocean. Our ocean is not quantum. For our ocean field to be quantum, we have two requirements. First, the waves in our sea must have some discrete magnitude. Because in quantum mechanics, things have discrete quantizations. This can be represented by the amplitude or height of the wave. Let's say the wave can be one meter, two meters, three meters, and so on. Each meter corresponds to the number of particles in any one place. But there's a second requirement too. A real quantum field is never calm. It always has some minimum energy state. So we will say that the one meter wave represents this minimum energy state of the field. The minimum energy of one meter is called the vacuum energy. It means that for a real quantum field, empty doesn't mean nothing. There's still something, some minimum energy present. Then each extra meter of amplitude or height is a real particle. Now, the interesting thing about quantum waves is that we can only create taller waves in increments of whole meters. So if we don't have enough energy to add at least one meter to the wave, then we won't have any change to the wave at all. In other words, there can be no 1.5 meter or 1.75 meter or even 1.9 meter waves. Only two meters, three meters, four meters, etc. So our quantum field is full of these minimum one meter waves and each extra meter is then a real particle. But we can only create these taller waves if we have enough energy to reach the next meter. If there's not enough energy to reach at least two meters, no taller wave is created. The one meter waves are from the quantum vacuum. They represent the non-empty minimal state. These quantum waves slosh around, and in some places, there might be momentarily enough energy to create a large two meter wave or a particle. But then, almost just as quickly as it's formed, the particle vanishes again in the sea of fluctuations. These are analogous to virtual particles that come in and out of existence all around us, but are undetectable because they last for too short a time. Since virtual particles cannot be directly observed, they only exist mathematically. However, they do result in other effects which can be detected, namely the Casimir effect, which happens due to a pressure difference caused by the virtual particles between the inside of two plates and outside of the plates. This is a unique effect supporting the idea that the universe consists of quantized fields rather than just quantum mechanics. The quantum field is like the sea. It's the background on which waves appear and disappear. And just like energy can create waves in the sea, energy added to the field generates particles, which we can observe. So in quantum field theory, we have a field that is never still, never empty, and we can create a particle if we have the exact amount of energy needed. But still, we should keep in mind that this is just a mathematical construct that appears to fit reality. If you expand this concept to other particles, we have to imagine other seas on top of seas representing a different field for each fundamental particle that we know of. So there would be a sea representing the field for electrons, for example, a field for photons, 
a field for quarks, etc. This concept led us to where we are now. We have this general theory called the standard model in which we include all known fundamental particles. And we assign individual fields to each type of particle. Now, what does fundamental in the word fundamental particle mean? From a mathematical point of view, it means that the particles of the standard model are the smallest particles from which we can construct the world around us. There is nothing smaller that we know of that these fundamental particles are made of. This brings the circle back to Democritus and the search for the minimal unit or particle of the universe. That's what we mean by fundamental. They are the most fundamental particles, at least for now. You have to remember that one time we considered the atom to be the smallest fundamental particle. Then we discovered the electron and proton, and later even smaller particles like quarks that the proton is made of. So maybe we shouldn't be so confident that we have really reached the ultimate fundamental level. What's more, the word fundamental really doesn't tell us a whole lot about the particle. In fact, we can't even directly detect all these particles. For example, quarks can never be observed as free particles. So these cannot be confirmed with direct observation. And for the particles we can observe, what we really see is an energy signal in our detectors, not the particle itself. So should the definition of a particle be an energy signal in our detectors? Perhaps, but I think we can do a bit better than that. As of now, the best description would be something like this. A fundamental particle is an excitation in a quantum field that is constantly in flux. There are at least as many fields as there are particles in the standard model. Each particle can propagate in its field. The interactions of these fields and exchange of energy results in particle creation and annihilation. Now, we must respect the fact that in the end, this is just what the math is telling. To really be satisfied and to get at the heart of physics, we need to be able to understand the physical story behind the math. So in this sense, physics is like a CSI crime scene where physicists are the protagonists examining all the evidence, finding little clues that are sometimes hidden from view or sometimes in plain sight but unrecognized, eventually building up to the story that tells us what really happened. If you want to learn quantum physics in detail from scratch, I think it's important to start with the basics. While I try to show you visually and intuitively how quantum mechanics works, to really understand the details, you have to get into the math. One of the best math courses available online is at Brilliant, today's sponsor, called Calculus in a Nutshell. It's a 14-part course that starts off covering the basics of the idea behind calculus, explaining the ideas of infinite sums, then getting into both derivatives and integrals. And then it brings these concepts home by showing how they can be applied to solve real world problems. Along your learning journey, you'll be guided through interactive lessons that not only make the learning process fun and intuitive, but will also help you retain what you just learned. Brilliant has a special offer for our Vinash viewers right now. If you're among the first 200 people to click the link in the description, you'll get 20% off your subscription. If you haven't tried Brilliant already, this is a great opportunity to start. So be sure to click the link in the description. And if you have a question, please leave it in the comments and I'll do my very best to answer it. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.